Uh, good morning, Shawnee Johnson. How are you getting on? Morning, man. How are you? Yeah, very well. Um, I'm going to reveal a little bit here. We were thinking earlier on in the week who'd be good to talk to you about what's going on in Kildare. Also, we should talk about Cavan, and your name came up. And then overnight, it turns out you've done a massive two and a half hour interview with um, the uh, GEA Social. It felt like about a six hour interview, to be honest. <laughs> Did it? <laughs> <laughs> ah, look, I, I haven't listened to, listened to it now. I don't think it only came out last night. So I got a few messages from a couple of lads there. So some of them have been, have been tuning in early. And <clears throat> um, are you nervous today then? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I am. Uh, I don't know what the feedback will be like from it. Um, I suppose it was very re- revealing. It was it was the first time I probably really sat down properly and and discussed the whole uh, the whole incident. Uh, and look, it was it was pretty honest and pretty forthcoming from from myself. So yeah, we'll we'll see what comes out of it. And um, look, obviously everybody can go off and listen to it. We we only have 15 minutes here, so it's not going to be anything similar. But are you was that something that you kind of felt like you needed to just have that conversation, get it over and done with? Cuz it feels a little bit like you you kind of wanted to tell your side of the story and reveal the toll that it took on you. Yeah, well, I suppose I never did it. Um and it was probably hard to do. Uh, it was something I, I found very difficult even bringing up the subject, to be honest. I'd kind of run a mile from it. So um, I have my wife to thank for pushing me down that avenue. So, um, yeah, look, it's done now. Uh, you know, it's 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 out there for, you know, people can obviously listen to it if they want to. Some people are probably sick of the whole of, of, of listening to it. So, yeah, look, it wasn't, it obviously wasn't easy. It was a tough uh, part of, of my life, I suppose. But look, yeah, we just keep moving on now. Yeah, and and I I do think sometimes that like I don't know, uh, obviously therapy and closure and all that kind of stuff. You never really get closure, but like it it feels like you, you said the incident there was how you refer to it. So <laughs> it feels like it's still something that's a little bit of at arm's length for you. It feels like you you kind of in retrospect. I was going to introduce you. The the script said former Cavan and Kildare <laughs> footballer, and I I added it out the Kildare thing just on the basis of. Haven't You're read very the kind, but it feels like you you don't you don't consider yourself a former Kildare footballer at all, really. Uh, well, uh, look, I didn't produce anything for them, which is uh, you know very hard for them to. You know, uh, it's one of the things they said, like they didn't get the I certainly didn't get the player that they thought they were going to get. Uh, it was just uh, pretty hard, I suppose, for me to perform to the level that I wanted. Uh, I just you know I found it difficult. Um, I've said all that in the interview where. I was probably so focused on still what was going on in Cavan because, look, I grew up wanting to play with Cavan. I absolutely love it. I love Cavan. Um, I know a lot of people will will throw that back at you. Well, you don't really. Yeah, it was just something that um, I think as a young child, when you when you achieve what you want to achieve in terms of playing with your own county, there's a rawness there, there's a passion there, there's a desire there. I thought I would be able to do that, uh, but no, I, I just wasn't so um, um, yeah it was un- unfortunate do, do you feel by talking about it now you might actually be able to kind of um, not give advice because that's wrong that kind of is positioning you as some kind of but like um, <laughs> just be an example to other people who might be considering going through it that actually you need to you kind of need to play a bit of chess and think what are all the repercussions of this yeah I think I have an empathy towards people you know, I have chatted to a couple of people in the past who've been maybe not as high profile of transfers, but I think it's important to take into account everything, not just the football side of things. Um, Now, maybe mine was, I don't want to use the word more high profile, but it definitely got more media attention than most people's would. But um, there is another aspect to it, like there's the personal aspect to it, there's the your own family's aspect to it. So, you know, and it's something that will will stick with you. And it was something that I was very naive around. I, I just thought that it would honestly thought that it would pass through fairly straightforwardly. Um, obviously, that didn't happen and you learn from those experiences. But yeah, no, it's definitely something that I have empathy towards people that are, you know, looking to to maybe do that or even, you know, go from different clubs or whatever it is or just even going through tough times, to be honest, that you're able to just know that there is a way out of it, to be fair. It, it normalises it too, Shawnee, like the, I guess the Shane Walsh incident, if you want to call it an incident again, uh, it brings it back into the, the conversation. But you talking about it, and like for someone like myself, I hadn't even realised, you know, the the background of the whole Calvin thing and getting dropped from the Calvin panel by Val Andrews over the phone in 2011, and the impact that would have on you as well. So, I guess telling the story, 
explains to a lot of people the rationale and the reasoning behind the decisions that you made. Yeah, look, maybe I should have come out earlier. Um, I suppose at that stage, uh, it was uh, it was so it was everywhere. Like, uh, and I I didn't want to add flame to the fire by coming out and doing interview after interview. And and trust me, like I, I was, I'd say I was approached nearly every day to do interview after interview. I did one interview, column keys, and at the end at the end of the whole thing, when everything was done, Maliki Maliki Clark had approached me, and he was extremely nice and brilliant, to be honest. Um, and after that, I just didn't do any more. I was trying to nearly play it down in my own head and trying to play it down in that I wouldn't be adding fuel to the fire or adding flames to the fire. But it, it took me a long time to sit down. I know Thomas and Ushin and they mentioned in the pod, they probably had looked for me to do it for maybe a year and a half at that stage. And I'd constantly said no to them. And the main reason I'd said no was I, I suppose I was involved with the cab and set up in a coaching capacity. And I didn't want to to make another scenario where it was just about me, you know, um, I was completely bought into their environment and the, the setup was going really well and I wanted it to be about the players and so on. So I didn't do it at that stage. And I, I, look, I didn't want to do it either. I was putting it off and putting it off because, you know, I'd I'd played around with it so much in my own head that I suppose I wanted to forget it and I was trying to forget it and trying to move on with my own life. But look, hopefully it, look, it helps someone and if someone can get something out of it, then yeah. You know, that, that's good for me. It, it must have been a cathartic process in in many ways as well, because uh, like even um, listening to you talking about being self conscious of people talking about you, and and that must be tough because at the end of the day, uh, this is an amateur sport. Do you know, these these aren't your human beings at the end of the day. So to to have to deal with that or or have that floating about your head must have been extremely difficult. Yeah, it was very difficult, but like at the end of the day, like they probably weren't. <laughs> Some of them were, but yeah. you know, it, 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 it was my own demons in my own head rather than anyone else's fault. It, it was just the self-consciousness side of things. And, you know, I don't know, people will probably say this is wrong. I, I don't want a big, massively high-profile life. I didn't want it at the time. I didn't know it was going to happen. Again, that was naive on my own behalf. Um, but yeah, like you're 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 walking around, and it was it was everybody seemed to be talking about it. it was in papers everywhere, and you know, again for me, it was it became a confidence issue where I was so insecure in myself that I was I was probably thinking that other people were constantly in conversation about me. But the reality of life is that people are so busy, and people have their own things to deal with. You know, I wasn't that important. I just had made myself more important in my own head than I actually was. I'd say, but yeah, look. It, I think things pass, things pass on and, yeah. and and you know it gets better like. I do think that's an interesting um and and maybe a little bit peculiar to Irish sport in particular in that if you come through at an early age you're kind of hot housed, you know, you're you're asked and and this happens in in lots of counties. Uh <laughs> maybe the bigger counties are actually better at dealing with this because they've had more people and there's there's less focus on individuals because there's success there. But if you come through in any county, be it Kildare or Cavan or Donegal at an early age, and you're kind of, you know, the next great thing, there's not a whole heap of time for you to develop the rest of your skills as like just a grown up. You know, you're, you're kind of, yeah. you're an entire... Well, there, was, there was definitely no media training anyway, I can assure you that down here. So uh, I see a lot of the, the top counties now are employing nearly media experts and for their players to... And I probably came out with some silly things at the time when when, when I think back on them as, a, as an older person, more experienced person now. But as you said, look, I wasn't prepared for it. Um, I didn't see it coming. Um, and then you're you're in a scenario where you're constantly being asked questions, not just with a microphone in front of you, but just in terms of locally, um you know, questions coming left, right, and centre, and I just wasn't. I wasn't prepared for that, and it's hard for me to admit that because you know, I think it's hard to admit fault in anything. It's hard to admit that you're not prepared for something in anything in life. But you know, I would have classed myself as, you know, articulate, able to handle myself in conversation. But when the when I don't use the phrase when the guns to your head or the microphones in front of you, it becomes more difficult. Yeah, and I think as well, um, yeah. like Geezer had such a power of attraction for the media that anything that he did there was a year where Kildare went through the qualifiers and every game was on telly <laughs> and like do you know that they had reached a point where everybody was interested in them because McGinney is such an incredible character and a lot of people didn't really like the fact that he was in Kildare and so therefore there was kind of people waiting to to smack him even within the county as it turned out and when the 
famously they knifed him by a single a single vote and that worked out really well for Kildare in the long run so I think that probably fed into the, the atmosphere around it in a way as well I, I, I just last point on this because we didn't get John to talk about this at all but obviously the, the story just broke overnight you're obviously you've, you've started your coaching journey and maybe it's important for you to get that parked and done and everybody go okay that, that bit's over as opposed to waiting for that story do you know what I mean? In a way that like this all makes perfect sense now in, in terms of timing. You're totally ready to talk about it, it turns out. And as you say, articulate whatever it was that happened at that time. But also now you can begin to use it as something you've come through adversity and hardship and experienced that. And now as a coach, when you're talking to players in whatever changing room, they're like, OK, well, Shawnee's had his ups and downs. Yeah, I think that's really important. And, you know, I, I'd like to hope that one of my strengths is that... I, you know, is honestly with my players. Uh, I have no problem sitting down and I probably find it a lot easier to talk to them 1v1 about my own experiences than I would to talk to anybody else. And I, I think it's something that they appreciate. Um, I think it makes you more human. You know, there's a there's an element of coaching or management where there's a management v players scenario or, or they see you as, as maybe a, a different type of figure. And, and that's certainly not... The manager that I that I want to be. Yes, there's obviously a, a there. I don't. It's not. A, it's not a divide. But there's a there's a difference between management and players, and there'll always be a, you know a, a, an arm's length there. But for them to know that there's a human element to the to the management side of things, uh, that there is someone here that has gone through adversity and hardship and has found a way to bounce back and wants to delve into those things and wants to be able to give his experience to those players. I think that can be a powerful tool for coaches and managing. It's funny yeah, that that you say that that how your your influence can rub off on your players because Geezer like Geezer moved to Nafina so he was through he went through a a club switch as well so like maybe was there an element of of you getting uh, I guess being comfortable with with talking to someone like Kieran McGinney about it because he had been through uh, I don't want to say something similar but but you know he had transferred yeah to be honest there wasn't much of a conversation around that um, with Kieran it was like okay this has gone through now get yourself ready, get yourself prepared, let's get ready to go now. There wasn't really much around uh, how are you feeling or so on. So it was like, yeah, and I can understand that. You know what I mean? He probably had taken a lot of flack around the whole thing as well. I certainly took a lot of flack. Uh, and then he was looking to go, okay, help me here. You know, become a better, you know, make this team better, be a better player, improve yourself. And I'll be honest, I learned a lot from him. Uh, a lot on the mental side of the uh, side of the game, you know how he thinks he's obsessive about it. Um, but yeah, look, it didn't work out, and you know, I've gone through the reasons, I suppose, in the pod about why I feel that it didn't work out. And people will always say, "Oh, look, you know, you you were too big for your boots. You weren't as good as you thought. You couldn't, you didn't perform when you went down there." And look, they all have valid reasons for that. But in my head, I have a, I suppose, a, a strong uh, reason why it didn't work for me. Um. Uh, as a Clare fan, I thought maybe put him in, give him some minutes, let him let him build some patterns of play with his teammates in the match environment. I thought, like, you know, how, how are you going to prove it if you don't get a chance to prove it? Yeah, I suppose that was difficult as well. I, I, in the 2013 National League, you know, I started off really well, actually. You know, we played... Uh, Clare played Cork and they played Kerry and... They played Dublin and, you know, I was scoring quite freely and then I picked up a knock and uh, it just never really got back to the levels where I, where I had been at there. So, yeah, look, when you're not playing, it's hard to get, a, I suppose, an idea of um, different movement patterns of different players when players are going to deliver the ball and so on. But, you know, I, I don't blame anyone, anyone else for me. I wasn't doing enough on the on the training field. And Kieran, in fairness, he's very clear on that. You know, he's picking the team completely based off what happens in training and as a coach and manager now, as a player, I probably didn't agree with that at the time. In my head, I was like, in the match, I'll be fine. I'm probably not the best trainer in the world, but I can fully see the idea of competition now. It's everything that I will base my own coaching and and uh, performance in terms of my management on will be how our players perform and training because it's just so important. And do you want to be a, an inter-county manager at some point? <laughs> uh, yeah, I think I do, yeah. Um I've got, I suppose, an insight into what it's, what it's like in the environment now. I absolutely love the high-performance environment of it. It's tough. It's time-consuming. Uh, with a young family, it's very, very tough. Um, for me now, it would I would be doing a disservice 
and it may never happen is the first thing to say. You know, I may never be good enough for it for it to happen, but I need to go and learn now and get better and keep on improving and keep on upskilling myself that if the time does come that I'm ready. You're making the right steps. You're you're involved in, in Monaghan Club management now with, with the reigning county champions, Bally Bay. I I suppose the first step is to keep Peter Pan Paul Finley involved for another year. Yeah, what a guy. Um really, really top class uh person, first of all, a top class player too. So um, that conversation will happen in due time. Paul has earned the right to take his little break there over the last few weeks. Um, I'm sure someone like him is, is keeping himself in, in good shape and so on. And that'll be a, a decision purely based for Paul and his family and where, where they're at. Are you younger than him? <laughs> yeah, I'll always say I'm younger than people. people. Hey. I, I never reveal him the age. But yeah, I definitely am younger than him. <laughs> um, and I'm very interested in this uh, as a manager what is your uh, view on the way that the game is going at the moment particularly teams ability to attack or their desire to attack yeah I, I don't buy into this negative vibe I, I love the way that the game is going you know you're seeing a lot of different types of games I watched Derry Dublin at the weekend I absolutely loved it uh, I watched numerous games over the last couple of weeks Different teams are trying to play different ways. You get different, uh, I suppose, the culture in different counties sometimes is different. Obviously, you know, the culture in Donegal, for instance, is very different to the culture in Cavan. Um, but it, it's exciting, like, it's intriguing. I think people just, people love giving out, like, um, instead of just going, okay, yeah, there's parts of the game that need to improve, absolutely. And there's parts of the game that have come on absolutely leaps and bounds over the last number of years. And they're going to continue to progress and continue to to uh, expand. Like I'm watching Derry at the minute. I'm absolutely loving watching them, the way they're trying to play, different elements of their attack. And people are going to nail Derry for being a, a negative team. You look at the amount of times they'll find five, six players in at the end line, holding their depth in their attack. For different reasons, they're trying to get hard runners and leave the space out around the 45. And then they're giving themselves options to work little pop passes or marks or so on. So, Is that this season though, Shawnee? That's what I'm, I'm wondering. Like... Um... <laughs> The no, Derek... I think they've got better at it this season. Okay. I think they were trying it last season. But I think now if you look at them, yeah, will they defend with 15 behind the ball? Absolutely, because that's the way Rory wants to play. And that's the way he feels that he can keep his uh, opposition to low numbers. But their uh, transition now from defence to attack is rapid. Um, they're gone and they're getting... You'll see that, You'll see Derry when they turn over the ball. There's about four or five players that will have nothing to do with the ball and they will sprint as quickly as they can to get to that 13-metre line to give them themselves that depth in the attack, give them the option to pop that little ball in. And with Derry, a lot of times it will be by fist because they don't like to kick the ball that much inside the opposition 40. But maybe that's their next step in their, in their expansion. I don't know what they're looking to do. There are remarkably less goals, uh, noticeably, Shawnee. Like, the, the attack of Mark has been blamed for for a lot of that like as a, as an inside forward what was what's your take on the on the attacking mark because clearly catching the ball well, coming a, down and scoring a goal is it, it, it's kind of taking away that art form yeah it is but as an inside forward it's a, a for me it's a dream it should be it, and to be honest I, I don't think it's something that teams are utilising near enough uh, in terms of it's it, it, it to me it's something that's going that needs to be expanded in terms of Teams need to look for this mark. It's there. Okay, we need to get over it. The GA will make their own decision on whether it's it's going to stay or not. Is it the best rule in the world? No, but it's in there. So teams now are going to start looking at, uh, or if they're not, they should be, okay, let's use this attack and mark to our advantage. At the end of the day, a corner forward gets a, a, a ball 15 metres, 20 metres, 25 metres from goal with a free shot they should score. So... You know, teams need to find ways, I suppose, of getting to the magic number for me of 19, 20 points. And gaining three points from attacking marks is getting yourself closer to that goal. So I think it's something that is is there for people to utilise more. And I think you'll see teams using it more often. Can we ask you about um, Paddy Lynch and, and, uh, and his evolution uh, we, we saw the great scenes in Westmead last year when they won the Towson Cup and obviously, you know, uh, Cavan didn't win it. But if they had won it, I think we'd be focused a lot more on their story and their situation this year. And I still think that there's a chance that they can cause a lot of trouble in the Ulster Football Championship. So uh, how important is Paddy Lynch going to be in all that? Um, well, firstly, I think it's guaranteed that they're going to cause a lot of trouble. Um, secondly, on Paddy, the sky's the limit for him. Um, I suppose I would have worked with him quite closely last year like if you're moulding the perfect inside corner forward now 
you're not looking too much further than Paddy Lynch. Left foot, right foot, power, size, good in the air, extremely accurate, brilliant free taker, uh, pace to take his man on, brilliant finisher in terms of goals. He got two at the weekend. He has everything it takes to be as good as anybody in the country. Um, and obviously there's one player in the country that is probably way out a, a, a ahead of everyone else. But in terms of the second wave coming, he has every attribute that you would want to be a successful and when I say a successful I mean a really really top class inter-county for, corner forward and again it's not me speaking out of school it's it's now how much Paddy wants to become that that player and from the, from the experience I have with him he's a hard worker he's a dedicated lad he's a really nice fella he's a quiet lad off the field but he just has he just has so many attributes and the, the future is really bright for him the two games he started, I mean, awfully kicked 10 points, 2-5 against Down in, in the last game as well. The, if, if he's an example to any young footballer, Shawnee, it's that practice with both feet because you trust him off either. Oh, no, no. Honestly, boys, the skill set is so high. Um, but that's not by chance. That's not by chance either. You know, that's hard work. Um, that's a lot of good work. I know a lot of the coaches that worked with him with Chris Law would be of really high quality as is, is, is manager at the minute with Chris Law. Is a, is a really smart guy as well. So he works really hard. He's got good people around him. Um, and like I say, the future is bright for him, but he's so good. Like you, you wouldn't know left or right with him. You wouldn't know the difference. Like I see him before training, he just, he can do stuff with the ball that you're just going, oh, wow. You know, there's not too many players that you kind of step back and, and, and they give you that bit of a wow factor, but he does. Funny you you talking there about coaching. I, I can sense I can sense the excitement in your voice when you're talking about current football and, and coaching generally speaking. I know you're someone. Are you are you like a sponge when it comes to high performance and and looking at other sports? I know you're a Liverpool fan, so Jurgen Klopp's example is probably <laughs> coming to mind, and a keen golfer as well. So are you taking little bits from other sports and kind of bringing it into your own levels of coaching? I look, I say I don't know if it's a strength or a weakness, one, but I, I suppose my personality and self is I'm obsessive, like when when I'm in something or I'm taking something on, it's I'm going to try and be as best as I can at it. So, you know, if I can learn stuff off other sports and it's something that I've delved into in terms of um, looking into different management techniques, looking into how people deal with play. And at the end of the day, management to me is how is dealing with people. So it's the same in any, in any job. If you go into a management element of it, you've got to be able to deal with people correctly. And that's probably what you're going to, live and die off in terms of management. Yes, you can be the most tactically astute person in the world. Um, yes, you can be the best technical coach in the world. You can have such a technical knowledge of attack and play, defensive play, how to tackle is. But at the end of the day, it comes down to people and getting those people to buy into what you want to do. Um, and like I say, you can have all those skills in the world. And if you can't manage people, they're not going to buy into it for you. Uh, we're nearly out of time. But what's going on with Kildare, Tony? <laughs> Um, yeah, they're in a they're in a precarious predicament. Um, I was looking up, you know, uh, their scoring ratio at the minute: thirteen points the first game, seven points the second game. We got sixteen against Clare, seven against Terry, twelve against Loud. So mainly they're not scoring enough. You know, I used the figure of nineteen twenty magic magic numbers there. They haven't hit it once this year, and they're in a precarious situation because obviously if they're in the bottom two to go to the Talton Cup, but if they finish sixth, I think there's a good chance they're going to go to the Talton Cup as well because. If Calvin Down or Fermanagh reach an Ulster final, then that knocks the sixth place in Division 2 into the Talton Cup. So, yeah, they have a couple of tricky ties. They have winnable games. It's the important thing to say. They have Limerick away, I think, next, and then they have Meath at home. So they really need to win those two games. They need to get their key players back in the field. I know Kevin Feely's back. He's what a player he is after a bad injury. Um they need to get, you know, they were missing Jimmy Highland the last day. He's top quality player. So they need to get their best players playing. But yeah, it's it's not a good place for them at the minute. Uh, one thing that we did want to get your final thoughts on was whether or not some of those teams, so me that looks like might be okay at this stage and <coughs> they obviously uh, could equally end up qualifying through Leinster. But would a me or a Kildare or like even we kind of saw down last season not being too bothered about the Talton Cup? those teams who would consider themselves Sam Maguire uh, standard I don't know, looking around for the right word there but uh, quality standard whatever entitled entitlement will they take the Talton Cup seriously do you think? Well I, I, I'll put it like this to you Calvin were in the Talton Cup last year 
and Cavan had won the Ulster Championship in 2020, have an ex, you know a broad history around the sport. You know, have five All Irons, obviously a long time ago, but there's a huge culture there of GA, like there is in Mead and Kildare. I don't think you are where you are right now, um, and I think it's really important. And the Talton Cup got a lot of uh, profile last year, maybe not as much as as I would like it to, to get because I think it's a fantastic competition. But I, I really think the scenes around Mullingar last year should set the scene for what it can do for a team. Like Westmead still have a really good chance to go to Division 2. Um, like I know the hurt that losing the Tatton Cup final had in our own county here. Uh, and, you know, for the players, for the management team, it was a difficult one to take. So, look, you are where you are and you're there because of your performances. Um, and the Talton Cup final gives you a really, really good um, carrot at the end of the stick in, in terms of it gets you back into the All-Ireland without having to worry about the National League last year. So you can see Calvin this year, they're going hell for leather. Uh, and they've been, to be honest, they've been so unlucky with the, with the Connacht Championship draw that even winning Division 3 doesn't guarantee them a route into the All-Ireland, which at the beginning of the year, before the draws came out, they would have thought that that was the case. So, um, look, it's a really good competition as you say, Mead would probably stay out of it, but yeah, it's something I think to be embraced. Who's, yeah. go, who's going to win Ulster and who's going to win the All-Ireland, Shawnee? Nice, easy one for you. Look, to me, the All-Ireland is so wide open this year, but <laughs> I mean that in the best possible way because you're still going to be looking at a lot of the same teams. But the teams in the second tier now, and I'm talking Derry, Galway, Mayo after last year, you, they're not in the carries in Dublin, so they got to got a, quite a bit of a, a hiding by Kerry last year in the All-Ireland so um, I think those teams now have a real opportunity there's an opportunity there for a team to potentially come out of the blue who's going to win the All-Ireland <clears throat> people will laugh at me now I'm, I'm going to say Mayo um, which is just the most maddest thing I think I've ever come across saying because I, <laughs> I, I just I've said Mayo for years and, and they never got across the line but they're phenomenal and I love watching them and I love what they bring to it Who's going to win Ulster? I think it'll be, honestly, I think it'll be a Derry Cavan final. And at the minute, you'd have to say Derry are favourites in that game, but, it'll, you know, Cavan won't fear, won't fear Derry, I don't think. And to, to, I'd give them every opportunity going in, but I'd say Derry would probably go back to back, which would be an unbelievable achievement for them. Um, sorry, that was great. I, I can imagine that sitting down with the, the two lads for the podcast was a bit like having teeth pulled because, uh, you know, who wants to revisit something as traumatic as that but it seems like it's been good for you so I wish you the very best today with the uh, texts and well wishes that are going to come your way because we didn't get into it but there's like a, a darkness of that story as well that I think you cover really well in the podcast so we wish you the very best with that and Thanks very um, much. looking forward to um, the, the next phase of your managerial career Okay, thanks very much and thanks very much for having me on much appreciated that's that brilliant there Shawnee Johnson uh, former Cavan and uh, erstwhile Kildare footballer for a while uh, 